properly. Don't worry, we're going live in a few seconds. Well, I want to turn off the phone. Yeah. Uh, power off. Power off. Phone off. Good. Brilliant. Okay. Yay, we're live. Okay. We're live. Good to be here. <laughs> Finally. It was Finally. So so uh, before we went on live, I said to Vincent, look, don't worry, we'll come on like 15 minutes in the unlikely event that there's going to be yeah. any And tech. there was a likely event. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent, it happens. Vincent, it happens I'm sometimes. Seriously, seriously excited. Thank you so much for being here today. It really is a privilege. Guys, if you don't know Vincent, I mean, who doesn't by this point? Um, but Vincent is an author and a campaigner. He's helped thousands of families in separated families in family court he's won five ombudsman inquiries including an invest in a parliamentary investigation against kafkas three 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 Jeez. two of the kafkas and so apart from being a campaigner a paid up member of the awkward squad oh, top 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 level right i know right um but he's also now coming out with a come out with a book vincent this arrived yesterday Love I read it. it cover to cover. Hope you weren't too bored. So I'm not going to give too much away. Well, I sort of am, sort of not. But throughout this, I'll be honest. I, I have one as well. <laughs> Funny that, isn't it? That's <laughs> right. Same book. <laughs> I read it cover to cover. And what I loved, I, I loved it, Vincent. I honestly did. I thought, Thank you. I thought it was honest, frank, practical. There were moments that I didn't expect to laugh out loud. I properly lolled. There were you could cry as well sometimes. Oh, it, it was just a big mix. And I love the forwards as well. They were quality. Absolute, Absolute quality. Absolutely amazing. People, people have sometimes asked me, what's the writing like in the book? And I just say, some of it is stunningly brilliant. That's the forewords written by others, not mine. <laughs> but the yeah, forewords are amazing. Erin Pitsy, who hardly needs introduction. I mean, only, her, only she could write that foreword. Right. Uh, Louis de Bernier, I mean, when you talk about writing, you know, I mean, Captain Coriolis, Mandoline, author and the like. And I have to say, Martin Dobney, ex-MEP, uh, he seriously got his act together on that. Yeah, he's not just a clown, as I often tell him. Uh, and also, I'm, I'm deeply indebted. I've had a lot of support with the book. I have a great support from William Collins on giving me his chapters and telling me, do whatever he wa I wanted with them. I mean, that's some trust. Uh, same with Nick Langford, with the author of the excellent book on exercise and absolute futility. And their chapters give it such veracity that I wouldn't have, you see. I haven't got that all-encompassing intellectual search, rigor, and display. So, yeah, it, it, the book turned out much better than expected. And uh, thanks to my better half, my fancy Sunita, for coming up with the idea on the front page, the scales. That yeah. That was her idea. That was her idea, yeah. And I have to say, the more you look at it, the better it looks. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's not me. That's the picture, <laughs> just in case you're confused. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wh when you were introducing me there, which is a very kind introduction, just to clarify, I've had five ombudsman investigations, uh, local government, one into solicitors regulatory authority, three parliamentary, two of those were into Kafka's, I also kickstarted an Ofsted investigation into children's services in Brent, which found it to be surprisingly inadequate. And I also was, um, if you look at LondonFathers.com, the website on me presenting the European Parliament, so European Petitions Commission in November 2014, I was fairly pivotal in creating a, an investigation, the only one that's ever occurred, by the EU Commission into systemic failings in UK family court services. Uh, that's one of my happier moments in life. You can see it on the video if you go onto LondonFathers.com website. But the reason why the book came about was because it did not matter how many successful investigations I had, how many parliamentary ombuds investigations, what success I had in Europe. It was invisible. I've contacted, I have them all in the book, about 70 different media outlets journalists, etc. Only two responded. Um, what's her name? Jill Moore, June Moore? Uh, Jane Moore, Jane Moore. She sent me a pleasant uh, letter because uh, she has personal experience of this to a friend of hers. 
apparently alienation. And surprisingly, Peter Hitchens sent me a handwritten note. Now, of all people, I mean, he, he and I are. <laughs> but there is a. But the point is, nobody in the mainstream media will touch this. It is verboten. Because it's a combination of self censorship, which is a brutal uh, paranoia almost, yeah. fear. And the fear of being named as being a anti-feminist, anti-mother, or just Philip standing up in Parliament shouting that you are a rape apologist. You know? <laughs> so it, it has them all silenced. When I, I contacted a lot of uh, publishers, and so did Martin Dubney, when he used to be helping me. He seems to have gone a bit uh, absent at the moment. Not totally. He mentioned me on Channel 5, Jeremy Vine, a week ago. But not one male publisher would even respond. That's insane. It's a deep source of embarrassment. And it's a deep factor in why the system is as bad as it is. Only the female publishers responded and engaged. To their credit. I've always said only women will bring about changes here. It won't be men. You probably know that quite well yourself. And uh, eventually uh, I met Grosvenor House Publishing. uh, And Becky Banning is assistant manager there. And she says straight away, let's push it on. No hesitation. No what if. There's too much information in here. Let's get it out. What a contrast. Yeah. But I want to go back a little bit because, you know, um, in all of those amazing things that you've done, you would think on the surface that you'd be somebody steeped in academia. But your background (laughs) is not, is it? So tell us a bit about your background. Well, I I left school in Northwest Ireland, age 17 with what's called a legal certificate, probably the equivalent of all levels in this country. And I took it literally. It meant I could leave. So at the age of 17, I left Ireland and came to England, worked for McAlpines for a few years. So I, I, I'm a qualified labourer, which is an exalted title to have. I also, because I love going broadside on forklift trucks, I'm the only person I believe in uh, McAlpine history to be barred from all forms of vehicles apart from a wheelbarrow. In fact, I'm barred from all forms of wheel vehicles. I beg your pardon. I can start a generator. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They had good reason to do that. That's another story. (laughs) Then I was a barman and a mechanic because I grew up in a garage in Northwest Ireland. My father and mother still alive. He has a load of old classic and vintage scrap, really. Some of it is good. And then I was went back, I was in Birmingham, 76, 79, because I was into the motorbikes big time. See, there's a lot of racing in the UK and it was a hotbed, a world hotbed of motorbike racing. And then I went back to Ireland for five years, got involved in racing there, became a barman because my motorbike seized and the owner of the pub was up for drunken driving. I was a non-drinker and my uncle was a sergeant prosecuting. So he got off and I got a job in the pub. I meant to be there for four days I was there for three and a half years. Wow. So that gave me a good background in dealing with the public. It's a posh pub in the Phoenix Park called The Hole in the Wall. And then I left Ireland. That's another sad story because I grew up in the Bordeaux region. And then in the 80s, politically and all the rest, it was a disaster zone. So anyone who wants to know if it was like living in Beirut, I wasn't that far removed from it at times. With all the checkpoints, gunpoints, I stopped by every set of clowns with uniforms. And I came over to London in 85, because I've been here ever since, desperate to become a motorbike courier and go back to racing. So I did get back to racing. I was a motorbike courier for 13 years. And then, astonishingly, I became a house husband, which was totally, absolutely unexpectedly. Loved that. I was doing that for nine years. And that came to a sudden stop because my ex-wife has uh, issues, let's put it very politely, although a high quality professional woman in many other regards. And when I wouldn't leave the family home uh, and do as she demanded, she went to the local services. And I, in my naivety, of course, assumed that local services were staffed by professionals. (laughs) So naive. (laughs) I mean, I am absolutely convinced there's nobody more stupid than me entering this business. In 2007, I didn't have a mobile phone. I had no desire to have one. I'd never been on a computer. I had no desire to be on a computer. All right. I was not interested. I was busy working, looking after the children, had a small workshop. We were looking after, at that stage, two, three properties 
doing her workplace. And I was so busy, I wasn't interested in all this gossip. And then to my astonishment, I found myself getting a load of court orders one morning. Uh, there was five orders in it, and they're all obtained ex party. I didn't even know what that was. It meant without notice. And to the court and other measures, I found out the principal evidence against me, which was that I had, in the presence of the mother and the children, causing them great terror and pain, repeatedly kicked the family dog and then killed it. <laughs> I'm laughing because I know what comes next. <laughs> and um, the, the, the sad thing, this was processed in Brent, Domestic Violence Agency, which is Women's Aid and a satellite of theirs called BDBAP, Brent Domestic Violence Advocacy Project, Stoke Advance. And their constitution and practice is only to assist female survivors of domestic abuse. And they organized a case conference and a married process, multi-agency risk assessment conference, where only the evidence, only the verdict on the evidence received in secret is brought. And the case conference had my ex-wife's business partner, members of her staff, her work colleagues. I mean, it, 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 it uh, embarrasses kangaroos, I would say. But when we got the evidence out later on by a court order, we uh, discovered that this dog was center page. This, this, this phantom dog, we never had a dog. <laughs> so if you had a dog, I might have kicked it in the butt on occasions. We never even had a dog to kick, <laughs> let alone kill. <laughs> but Shadow, as my family promptly called them, because they have a wicked sense of humor, Shadow got two pages. And I was barred from seeing the children until I had done suitable courses for engaging with my extreme psychotic violence. And the people who kick and kill animals and torture them are very really likely to do the same to humans. And my ex-wife was on helicopter alert from the Metropolitan Police because of the likelihood of being killed by me based on the evidence received of what I'd done to the dog that never existed. <laughs> I mean, I laugh now, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't take it seriously. And uh, that was the beginning of my introduction to this business. And all I knew, oh, at that stage I was living in a, in a garage, but it was an integral garage in the house that I owned before the marriage, which wasn't far away from the family home. And I was crippled with arthritis because I had big, major problems. I've had big operations and I'm much, much better over the last number of years. Born again, teenager or child, adolescent. And I, Thought in the beginning, this is madness, it'll all get sorted out. See? So when we went to court, when I got to court, because I wasn't at the first court, because I didn't know about it, ex party, uh, the judge was very angry, and I thought to myself, this is good. But uh, all the evidence was procured, and then I could see that the judge was a decent person trying to get to the evidence and all the rest. So I thought, okay, we're going somewhere here. And a guardian was brought in, and that was a descent into hell. The guardian, the moment she saw me, it was like, uh, you know, uh, me, first of all, things, magnetic, magnetic poles, the ones that can't meet, straight away. First thing she told me is that I had not been the primary care of my children, which I had been for over nine years. And I had great support from family and friends, and because I was on a residence association, I had done a lot of work on CPZ, control partner zone of that, wheeling the kids around, collecting signatures and all the rest. I was very well known. I ended up with um, 54 witness statements. I had 19 about shadow. I had 29 I was, because we had councillors, police officers, uh, a free man of the city of London, even writing, because uh, they all knew it as being absolute fact. And of course, I kept a few in reserve because I was afraid of some legal trickery, because I was unrepresented, that they would take them off me and not allow them to be used. The judge was quite happy with me getting whatever statements I wanted, I have to say. And a guardian invited me to a meeting, and that was, uh, there's a chapter in that in the book, and that was the worst occasion of my life. I did not realise pure, total bigotry until then. And uh, in the meantime, I had a court order that the children could be with me for a week. This was in August 2007, and I had permission to take them to Ireland, which they'd been asking for all the time, which they had gone to every year. But the mother asked social services to help her break the court order, and they did. And that caused the children, the two boys particularly, huge problems. 
the youngest one was uh, in nursery at the time. She put him into a nursery unknown to me. And he was woken up from sleep by the social worker. This is all in notes from the centre. And he was asked three times, and he'd hardly seen me in the previous two months, bear in mind, because of the court orders. He was asked three times, did you want to be with mummy or daddy during the holidays? And at the third time, he said mummy instead of daddy. And on the basis of that, the judge or the social worker said he shouldn't be going to Ireland. And the older child was under horrendous pressure. I'm not going to go into detail. Such pressure that he's, he's, he started self-harming and worse. And when I found out about this, when I came back from the week holiday, Social services declared the case closed because the perpetrator of the violence had been removed from the family home. So that was when I decided, okay, it's now maturity time, Vincent. You only got one function in life now, kick the malpractice out of these individuals. So that's what started me. I never was serious about anything in my life. I know concerts have been serious. I was always taken to proverbial. Life to me was a joke. So uh, the joke changed. And here we are 14 years later, a long journey it is a long journey one of the things that you talk about in your book is the systematic problems in family court oh yeah and as we've just talked about some of this stuff if you're not in it you'd swear to god that there was somebody with candid camera about to jump out the bushes and go ha gotcha well i've long believed i was a mckenzie friend for many years i stopped it in 2019 to preserve the last one percent of my sanity I've long believed that the major protection factor in the system is that it's so bad, people outside the system wouldn't believe you if you told them, because they don't want to believe you. Yeah. I mean, I'm also chair of the Central London branch of Families Need Fathers, the Shared Parenting Charity in North London, with meetings every week. And I've been attending these meetings since 2007, chair since 2011. And the biggest problem is, as you know quite well, 80% of newcomers simply cannot believe this system exists they think they're the only one it's ever happened to, that there's MPs and everybody else going to be asking questions in Houses of Parliament. They keep talking about their rights, not realising they have a zero. Right. And if you don't understand the word a zero or the word none, you're not going to go very far. Now, technically, neither has the mother, but of course, it's the vast pyramid structure. The gateway to the family courts determines the outcome 95% of the time. And the social services, the domestic violence agencies, one, one by Women's Aid and Refuge. I mean, I had rang them for help myself and was signposted to a solicitor and that I was told to get a solicitor. They call that signposting help. Well, that's very good, but the problem is <laughs> I had no money. <laughs> so it's like telling a homeless person to book into the supply. That's... And I, 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 the, the amount of um, profiteering ideologically, number one, and financially, number two, from children's misery is unlimited. And nobody has, in my opinion, brought this properly to the attention of the public. And I believe that's why I knew I had to get validity. I had to get the certification of bad practice, shall we say, because I'm a motorbike mechanic, you say. So if a bike doesn't work, what's wrong? Has it got fuel? Has it got spark? All the basics, has it got compression? So if it has A, B, C, and D, then it should work. So I knew that I needed to get the ombudsman's investigations because before I joined Families Need Father, a good friend of mine had got me a list of, because he gave me his son's computer and he did a lot of time helping me. I mean, the amount of help I had was just unbelievable, Inclu including financial help, which is pivotal because without that you are. And um, I rang up eight or nine of these father's groups as I was led to believe. And all there was an angry man with a laptop in a bedsit complaining. Well, I could complain myself. I wasn't interested in complaining. I was interested in doing something. Right. Number one, be involved with my own children. And two, then, sort out this system bigger. But the inertia in modern men, uh, and particularly those who have been smashed in this system, which is so many, the only comparison I can make, as I've written in the book, is in tribal associations, when the man was done a wrongdoing, was banished from the tribe, they often died within a couple of weeks because the desire to will was gone. The whole reason for existing was removed. The history was being erased because one person knows in control of it. And that's the only thing I can compare so many modern men to. I'm definitely no men's rights advocates because they hate me more than anyone because all I'm doing is telling them they're useless and they're embarrassment. So I'm never going to be popular. 
Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think even you in your book, you admitted that some people might think that with everything that you've been through, that, you know, that you didn't like your ex-wife, you hated your ex-wife and, and you hated women. But none of that is true. But, go on. Well, uh, the biggest supporters I've had is from women. Yeah. My mother, my sisters, female friends, the, the wives of good male friends. My ex-wife can't help the way she is. I can't say what it is, obviously, because I'm subject to legal action and all the rest. She can't. Uh, so this is the system that's there. I had nine years of looking after children as a primary carer. I never remotely in my life expected to have, and I absolutely loved it. I've, I've got three children. Okay, I'm not seeing two of them, but I've got three children I would may never have had only for her. I was a primary carer wearing three children thanks to her. So why should I hate her? Yeah, that's like hating the rain. All you're doing is hating. Now, I have no belief whatsoever in these men who attack females, or particularly those who attack all feminists. Because they can't understand, it's only a small section of the radical feminists that have so much control here. Yeah. And not alone that, it is them the are at fault, not the feminists, not the women. It's them for doing nothing, indulging in conspiracy theories. Right. It's either the um, Frankfurt School or the Brandenburg or the G7. I mean, they sound like miniature acolytes of David Icke. <laughs> and they believe this nonsense because they want to believe it. And what I love when they tell me is, ah, but you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, from one man in his bed said, I hasn't even got a dog, <laughs> you know. Uh, if you understood, oh yeah, right. And um, but what my, my my real anger is not against ordinary working men, because they're just too desperate trying to earn a living. Yeah. Uh, you can, there's no good blame on them. It's the middle class intellectuals who turn a blind eye. Mm -hmm. It's the lecturers, the the social workers, the policy makers, the local government uh, chiefs, and all the rest. They're the ones I have anger against. Yeah. Because they are not just not protecting children. They are putting their ego and their desire for cheap, oh, I'm new age, I defend women. How patronizing that is that these double chinned, pot bellied, weak individuals are saying, I defend women. Huh? It's cartoonish. No scriptwriter, in my opinion, could ever do this system justice. It's very true, very true. Speaking of um, script, almost like a, like a cast of people, if you will, in the yeah. kind of comedy farce that is absolute family court. But you talk about the judges. You thought because in your case, you know, there were judges. They were they were quite nice. They they tried. Oh, the, the judges yeah. in my case, they tried hard. I look upon the family courts as being this way. It's a broken system now. It was very badly broken then. It was worse broken now. COVID and all the rest. But the judges did try to get to the bottom of it in a very bad system. I didn't see that at the time in the beginning, but I did see it as time went on. I've had 43 hearings in my own case. Uh, five of them represented on borrowed money, and the rest is a litigant in person. The judges do try, but they have such a morass around them. And with the 98% failure to enforce their own orders. So the two principal failings in the courts, as I see it, are number one, they work hand in glove, particularly Kafka's, they work hand in glove with, that's Children and Family Court Advisory Support Service. They work hand in glove with agencies to discriminate on grounds of service for the introduction to the gateway. They control the injunctions and all the rest. And then they don't enforce their own orders. So how they can say that the welfare of the child is paramount with these two overriding factors, it's a complete mockery of the term. I mean, that's the equivalent of you had in Vietnam where the fellow, the lieutenant, responsible for the massacre of a village, my lie, said, to save the village, we had to destroy it. I love that quote. It's that level of double think. But because it's not subject to any scrutiny, because they're in secret, no male politician is prepared to investigate. The female politicians only claim it's not doing bad enough because it's allowing men seeing their children, as we see regularly from the attempts in the House of Parliament, course of the control world practice direction 12J and all the rest. I mean, there are many female politicians now, particularly in the Labour Party, who believe that it, once there's allegations of domestic abuse, it's fact. Yes. It cannot be tested. 
Yeah. Not alone that, the litigant shouldn't be allowed to cross-examine the accuser because she's feeling further oppressed. I mean, the only comparison I can make here is some sections of very ultra-conservative um, Muslim faith believe that the reason why women can't drive cars and can't be allowed out to give evidence in court without a man is because they're incomplete in faith and logic. Now, I consider that a nonsense, I might add. But you have almost the same mindset in the family court and associated pyramid structure. That women aren't capable of doing anything unless there's a system protecting them. It, it brings women back to pre-Victorian levels. Totally. I, can, I mean, I can imagine you being one of these vulnerable women. Can you imagine that? <laughs> you know? Oh, I shall faint. Possibly yeah. Smelling salts. Smelling salts. <laughs> yeah. So we, you do a couple of chapters in your book. Um, dedicated to local authority and mm -hmm. Kafkas. Yeah. And you've had the pleasure of uh, getting to know both of those <laughs> quite oh, very well. Very well. Very well. I love them. <laughs> and I'm sure they feel just as positive about you too. <laughs> well, they actually, they change personnel so often. Yes. Uh, I mean, I'm unknown within Brent at the moment uh, because they don't know what I've done in the past because the personnel just changes. A few radical ideologues control the system. You have a few totemic men in charge of the system. You mean, you might as well have a poll with idiot on top of it and say idiot is the MD. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what I see so often. And they change every few years. Uh, so there's no consistency whatsoever. I mean, for example, in February of 2021, that's this year, I attempted to get all subject access requests, all the information Brent has about me. Before the book was launched, I decided I'd better find out what Brent has about me in total. Now consider this. They sent me on the freedom on the subject access request, I think it's 658 pages in egress in five folders. Oh my God. All right. Took me a while to negotiate that. <laughs> about 15% of it is redacted. What they have redacted is the names of the children I was at that stage looking after, the name of the woman I was living with at that time, and the address of the house I was living in. But they've redacted that repeatedly. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not supposed to know the name of my children, the name of my wife, or the then wife, and the address I was living at. So that's one thing. What's the bigger joke? Nothing came from, even though women's aid with an E, spelled with the next E, and B, D, V, A, P, are referenced every two or three pages. None of their evidence is presented. Now, I know there's 11 pages, but maybe more, that the B, D, V, A, P, Stoke Women's Aid has about me, which involves the phantom dog and other similar things. That's not the maddest. I was also accused of going into border towns in the 80s in Ireland with a firearm over my shoulder, often to shoot dogs. Because <laughs> I grew up on the border. Now, anyone who grew up in that area, lived in that area at that time with the amount of military all around, can you imagine walking up to a border town with a firearm and expecting to live? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be able to count the holes that'd be in you. But this is how it was presented as, and nobody questioned it. No. They have not given me that evidence to this day. And under pressure, they have said, Brent Council have said in an email to me that they are not responsible for the agency they have commissioned. And the police, they, they say the police are responsible. The police have told me in an email, nothing to do with us. And it is nothing to do with the police. It's Brent who brought them in. It's Brent who pays them. It's Brent who gives them extra bonus payments on a regular basis. But Brent is not in control of them. So you have complete farcical situation here. And that's in Brent alone. Now, I don't know what other boroughs are like, but I wouldn't say they're that much difference. No, no, definitely not. One of the questions that you and I both get asked a lot um, is, is the system biased? And before we roll our eyes, um, just want to talk a little bit about that, because mm -hmm. a lot of the gateway as you talk about it is we talk about you have to do mediation before mm -hmm. you can put an application into court. Yeah. And a lot of women can actually bypass that and get through to a solicitor straight away. So in your own words, because they hear me bang on about it um, ad nauseum, talk us through that process. Well, it came about from LASPO, Legal Aid Sentence and Punishment of Offenders, 
which was enacted in 2013. And straight away, that only gave legal aid where there was domestic abuse. Now, allegations of domestic abuse are considered evidence of domestic abuse. And of course, there are women who have been abused, have been abused, and will be abused. And there should be proper criminal action against those who are doing it. But the system came about, may not have been invented already, I don't know, that only females can access these agencies, because I have it on their Freedom of Information with my MP. In the Constitution and practice, they only help female survivors of domestic abuse. So Kafka's works hand in glove with women's aid, because I know that from the management meeting at Kafka's, which I've referred to in the book as well. And uh, so when you have the court's own advisors working hand in glove with agencies that will only discriminate purely on grounds of gender for access to services, access to legal aid, or where the means tested would obviously mean the woman wouldn't get legal aid, she gets the injunctions, the ex parte injunctions. That's without notice. Uh, Kafka's commissioned domestic violence agencies, the Domestic Violence Intervention Project, the Domestic Violence Perpetrator Program, whatever acronym they want, is only for male perpetrators. So in case you're confused about how biased the system is, all you need to do is read the Jim Crow laws that used to exist till 1967 in the southern states of North America. There you are guilty by color. In the UK family court system, you're guilty by gender. Now, there's exceptions to that, and there are decent women who lose out terribly in this business. And I've known of mothers who just wanted a divorce. They can't stand the father. I, I wouldn't blame them there sometimes, but they just wanted a divorce. But once they're in this system, they're encouraged to make false allegations. I mean, the dog in my case was only brought about because the mother was told, I have it in print, the mother was told that she didn't have enough to get an injunction. Has you ever been known to abuse animals? So suddenly, Shadow came howling to the rescue. <laughs> and i've known mothers who have tried who have tried to withdraw the allegations once they got into court because of course they they fear the family court and i've known kafka's and social workers tell them that we'll investigate your management of your children if you go ahead with this you're in our system see and you don't screw our system we are the system and i've known mothers who've lost residence of the children by not being able to uh, substantiate the false allegations, which they were encouraged to make at the initiation stages, then they lose out totally. And of course, the father then too often is so embittered about what's happened to him, that he then won't let the mother see the child or the children. So you have parental alienation at the wellspring at all occasions. You look at the continent and any developed nation to have an inquisitorial system. You look at Finland, for example, it's only 2% of the expense of the UK and it has infinitely better outcomes. Okay. Okay. But we're always told in the UK the welfare of the child is paramount consideration with a zero valid- validity. So, uh, and I, once again, I blame the men in society for allowing it to happen. I'm sorry, the book has to stop somewhere. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think something else that I know I certainly talk about and you talk about it in your book is the idea of it everything being so adversarial i mean solicitors love a good fight and when you're stuck in that system the last thing that you think and you want is that fight upon fight upon fight right well what you have is legalized cage fighting the mother 95 percent of the time there's exceptions of course nominally the parties are equal in the court that's equivalent of giving two people uh Telling two people to get involved in a duel. One is a loaded pistol, one is an empty pistol, but you both have pistols. Same thing, you see? And you are in this idiotic system that for no particular reason, on average, takes about two years, takes on average six to 10 hearings. I mean, I know of a couple of cases of 80 plus hearings. Yeah, Uh, uh, because these these people involved in this were, they were experts at, um, a, how would I say, reconciliation in senior banking structures and things like that. So they had the skill, but the children, all you have is a hollowed out wreck of a child. Yeah. Even at the beginning. I can look at photographs of children pre-divorce and post-divorce. And you look at the eyes, you'll see the difference. The, the openness, the trust, the innocence has been gone. Yeah. 
And there's a huge amount of evidence that's been suppressed of showing the damage to the emotional development of the children. And this is the part of the family court pyramid structure. I have no forgiveness for and never will. As far as I'm concerned, there are many people in this business who should be looking at jail time for facilitating and promoting false allegations based on ideology and total disregard for the damage to children, but pretend it to be about the children. It's like the first time I left Kafka's when I noticed that no space for black men to sign in <laughs> and their equalities directive while they were processing me for shadow. He featured at that meeting as well on my dad. Two pages became a typing error. I mean, you know, that dog, I tell you, he caused a lot of problems. He did. <laughs> <laughs> but leaving that absurdity aside, and limping down the stairs with my uh, walking stick at the time, the expression that came to me was, discrimination works best when cloak with the guys are concerned. Now, I don't know who gave me that, okay? It's like a little arrow coming down. Not like Cupid now. I know Cupid had an arrow, but this is a different arrow. A different arrow. And I realized that is so, so pivotal in this process that the guise of concern is the discrimination, it's in secret, and that the number one, the system protects itself brilliantly. It really is awesome at self-protection. Two, it is even more skilled at portraying itself as being purely about the welfare of the children. And I believe the professionals within it are so enmeshed in this, it's like a cult. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, 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 they have no other mantra. It's wide open to abuse by endless agencies and associations on the correct narrative. Yeah. I emphasize the correct narrative. There is a huge industry, as an Austrian MEP pointed out to me, uh, she died last year, sadly, that woman, um, when I got to the European Commission, Petitions Commission, she said, I mean, this sentence, it's stunning. She said, it is obvious that in the UK, the welfare of the child means the welfare of the professionals at the expense of the child. Oh my God, that floored me. Yeah. That's it in one. Yeah. And what I couldn't get over was these female MEPs that Klaus had set me up with to meet after the brief petition, the hilarious petition. They couldn't get over. Among the expressions I heard from these uh, women MEPs who are among the highest sections of authority is that the UK family courts, which is by far the worst in Europe, I might add, and they know it, is draconian, stuck in a toxic 1970s feminist mindset, barbaric. <clears throat> and what they can't get over, and all these women, they don't shout about being feminist because to them, there's no need to shout about it. You're equal in society, you, you, you insist on equality, as you should, of course. And then you have equality down to varying abilities of the individuals. That's fine, okay? I can't do lots of things women can do, vice versa. We're meant to assist each other. They can't understand how the UK is stuck in this 1970s radical Marxist feminist mindset. And it wasn't until I met Erin Pitsy, mm -hmm. who I wrote about in the book, and he did such a brilliant foreword, that my was open so much. Because in a few sentences, I've always noticed that the truly capable people don't have to use big words or anything else. They can just nail it in simple sentences. I don't have that ability, but you know, I'm trying to learn. <laughs> and she has written a book called um, This Way to the Revolution. And so basically what you had was crazed freaks who just basically took over the entire family court system. Yeah. And it is absolute mind boggling. I want to talk about Brussels because yeah. there was, and I want you to just, because this one little story had me proper rolling. The party. Roller, honestly. Um, but you talk about being prepared. In fact, the six P's. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yes. And then, but you also throw in a bit of humour and a little bit of clowning seemed to go a long way. I want to tell everyone about what you did with the microphone. That honestly, oh, yeah. I read it, I was howling. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. I spent years more by Grayson, but wasn't very good at it, apart from two occasions when I was desperate. And I got poor results, but I did far better than I ever had otherwise. I only seem to function in the far edges of lunacy almost when I, when I most function. Otherwise, I just don't really function. So we were told, and I got an email from the petition secretariat that I would have five minutes to speak because at that stage I had four ombudsmen. I hadn't got my last Kafka's parliamentary, but that's another one. I already had one. 
And because I was introduced as being the UK's foremost expert, which is a joke, well, maybe I am, on systemic failings, because the motion in the UK Petitions Commission was uh, systemic failings of UK family court services. I mean, I couldn't have written it better myself. So we got to the, I mean, getting there was entertaining with the security clearances and all the rest. And Klaus had been so well prepared and then he fell apart. And then I got him re-prepared, shall we say? And it wouldn't be a good idea to say on camera how I got him re-prepared because, you know, <laughs> I fear jail sentences as much as the next. <laughs> so when we got into the, uh, the auditorium, this uh, well-dressed Urbane Englishman approached me and I knew, well, this fellow meant trouble. Uh, he, I met a few of them in Northern Ireland. They're the ones who cause serious problems. And he says, regrettably, Mr. McGovern, you will not be allowed to present your petition. I thought to myself, okay, the dark forces are at work, but let's see how we can get around it. All right. So I, I thanked him for his uh, information, mentally thinking, yeah. <laughs> so away he went and sat down beside the Greek chair, a woman with a very heavy accent. Well, if I was Greek, it would have a heavy accent too. So Klaus is hid by his bit, and he referenced me. And uh, I was given one moment, one moment, she said, to speak. Suddenly I had to ad lib out of the blue. I had a lovely prepared statement. I practiced it 20 times. I could say it in four minutes, 57 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly not necessary. <laughs> so I thought I didn't want to go through the two year uh, program to get uh, a petition off the ground. All right, that's the last thing I wanted. I might live two years. So I decided she's a human. If she thinks I'm stupid, you might feel sorry for me. So you have the, <laughs> you have these lovely little microphones, you see, but they're on a large base, you see, because they have the speakers there and they have all the controls for the 12 different languages or something. So I thought, okay, I'll show you what an Irishman can do. I lifted the whole lot up. <laughs> I lifted the entire lot up and spoke into it <laughs> earnestly as if I didn't know what I was doing. She obviously thought to herself, I've never seen such an idiot. <laughs> I, I let him have his petition. So she said, OK, you do not have to. Your petition will be accepted. <laughs> <laughs> that it, it, amazing. Just... It, 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 it was like leaving the Kafkas and the expression that came to me. Out of nowhere, I thought, what can I do? I was desperate. Yeah, because I didn't want to go through the two year. It would get lost. It was actually better the second time we got to, to the European Petitions Commission which was in um, 11th of November, 2014. The first one was in 19th of March. And we got invited back. Oh my God. I mean, myself and Klaus, we were invited back to the petition. Now the children's EU commissioner, a man called Rainer Wieland, lovely, big, strong man. He's a children's EU commissioner, he's an MEP. Klaus didn't even, even know he was his MEP till I educated him, yeah, but that's life. Uh, so, he invited us into his office on the morning we went over the second time. Lights up a fag, puts out his long legs and starts talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> and he shouts at me, executor. And I didn't know what he meant, executor. What he, he, what he meant was actually execution of the order. Because the UK had almost a zero compliance with orders, you see. So once again, I had my five minute presentation down to about four minutes, 56 seconds this time. <laughs> and he looks at it, he said, he literally just threw it one side. And I'm thinking, <laughs> that's my life's work. <laughs> and he gave us the fo what to focus on. So my seven class went outside, some frantic scribbling and once again, we found out that my five minutes was taken away. So Klaus says, I will share with you. Now, listen, the man, you know, credit for his due. All right. So actually, I got three minutes. So Klaus did his brilliant presentation, I have to say. I did mine. And then there followed 17 minutes, I think, of the EU Legal Affairs Commission droning on and on and on about why they couldn't investigate. And because uh, there was never ever an investigation seen into a sovereign state by the EU Children's Commission. And the one they all wanted was the UK because it's so far below 
competence. It, it, it's just horror to them. He showed me in his office, uh, the, children, the EU Children's Commissioner, well, he had a few offices with different staff. The staff were lovely, I might add. Lovely people. Um, it was like one of those cartoons. The complaints about the UK was that high, and other countries wasn't more than about three, four inches. And the UK was about two foot. <laughs> they had to prop it against two walls to not fall over. Yeah, it, that describes it better than anything. And all it was from the children's, uh, the justice minister of whatever in the UK saying that as the welfare of the child is paramount consideration, and he, he goes to pretend puke, because <laughs> that's all his worth is puke. So he then came in, Rainer, Rainer, Rainer Wieland, came back in after about 17, 18 minutes into the video, and he brilliantly outmaneuvered the legal person. I mean, it, it was beautiful to watch. Oh my God, it's one of the highlights of my life. And the EU Commission agreed to bring it up to the regulatory body, agreed to do an investigation in UK Family Court Services, and there's a timetable and all the rest for this. But you see, what we piggybacked, myself and Klaus, on the fact that the forced adoptions, which was endemic in the UK at that stage, particularly with foreign mothers, yeah. whose English wasn't the best. I mean, this is a war on poor people, I might add, this whole system, yes. particularly on working class people. Yeah, yeah. And um, but so James Mumby in the meantime had come in to a man I have deep respect for, I might say, I might add. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people hate me for saying that. Well, tough luck. He Same really thing. did try. He really did try to bring about improvement in the family court system. But he, he was a, a lone voice and he was outmaneuvered and it's gone worse. But he did try. And um, there was a brief investigation. But in the meantime, there was a 53% reduction in forced adoptions against the wishes of both parents. Dame Justice Poff, you think it was, did a brilliant piece on cut and paste adoptions. I have a chapter on that in the book. So with regard to my bit about the marriage process and all the rest, that got nowhere really, but they agreed that orders made in any other high court in the EU are relevant in the UK because before this, the UK had always said the welfare of the child is paramount and the orders from abroad don't count. <laughs> I mean, it's like quite a joke. And they also, what's the second one we got? We got something else at the same time, but nobody ever told me. I found it out through an insider. So, you know, I, I often felt I'm, I'm like a mole walking away on the ground. Nobody sees what I'm doing. Yeah. This is of me digging HS2. I dig up the whole Midlands. <laughs> nobody would know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to Wales if you want to dig on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Teach all those Welsh miners how to go digging. Show them how it's done. <laughs> yeah. Both you and I deal with litigants in persons day in and day out. And you've already talked about the fact that for any um, person going through court, it's going to cost money. I want to know, and you've mentioned it brief in your book, but what would be your top tips for litigants in persons? Well, I've done a, a chapter on it. Yes. And it's also on the London Fathers website, uh, Litigants in Person. The first thing I would say to 95% of fathers going into the family court process is number one, go to the local locksmith, get a lock with a combination, lock them out. Yes. Right? It's about the best, best advice I can give. <clears throat> yeah. Because all they want to do is tell usually the other side's counsel what to think of, and do you know, and do you know, I mean, if you want to hang yourself, do it silently and quietly somewhere. Yeah, that's my advice. So number one, shut up. Two, everything you understand about logic and fair play, it's in the bin. It does not exist, right? So get that out of your head. Three, and this is the most important part, because that's the first two, there is a system. It's very rigged. It's very biased. It's overall very ineffective, but there is a system. And if you learn how to engage with the system, you have a good chance of getting the result. Now, my definition of result would be meaningful shared parenting, no less than 30, 35% of the child's free time. That's my definition of result. I have no time for these usually fathers shouting about 50-50. Shut up. Because <laughs> when the mother gave birth, you are not pushing as well. It wasn't 50-50. That's nature, all right? So I don't have a problem with the mother being the primary parent. What I have a major problem with is the system facilitating and promoting false allegations. That means the mother's going to be the sole parent 
Right. That is my anger. So as far as I'm concerned, it should never go below 35% of the child's free time. That should be the starting position of my dad, not the zero we currently have. Yes. And that is a waste of time, given out about the mother, unless there's a fine in the fact where you can adequately state what, well, and the Court of Appeals has changed that recently, as you know, that I know. Yeah. But it's a complete waste of time bad the mother because you're in an adversarial system for she has the children. So you're not just up against her, you're up against her and the state. Operating in secret with unlimited funds and unlimited powers. And this is what men can't understand because they keep talking about, I have my rights to see my child. No, you have no rights. I parent responsibility. The first sentence and the second paragraph parent responsibility clearly states, if you're not living with the children, parent responsibility does not give you the right to see them. If you don't understand does not, you're not gonna go very far. When people start shouting about their rights and law, I direct them to section two, subsection four of the Children Act. The wording is the father is no longer the natural guardian of his child since 1989. Realistically, what that means is, and I've heard it written, I've seen it written in the past by Boris's blogs and that, that for the widens of doubt, the father is no longer the legal guardian of his children. So if you don't understand no longer, now I know emotion that's very difficult to take in. Yes. It was extremely difficult. Yes. Yeah. And that is the bulwark that destroys so many fathers, litigants in person, because they are emotionally non-functioning. They're all over the place. Logically, they're greatly reduced function. Yes. I would say it took me six, eight months to get back to my normal functionality. And that was in the final effect with a, a very good McKenzie friend, which is a job that you do. But if you want to assume that I have ability based on the book and the Ombudsman's investigations and had a very good McKenzie friend, and we had judges who want to get to the bottom of this and who threw out all the Brent nonsense and I might add the Kafka's nonsense as well. I mean, I'm, but that took 20 hearings almost. Who can we get through all that? What average person has got a support network? Yeah. I had houses, when I hollered with the children, I had other people's houses I could go to, the children used to know, and the wonderful times. Who else has that network of the working class community, shall we say? No such thing. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so the system is so rigged, it's almost impossible to get over. But what I would say to fathers is, and 99.9% of the time it is wasted. Number one, learn how to fight to survive in this business. And then when you get a result for your children, then walk about changing the system. But no, they all want to shout about it now. Yeah. It ain't going to happen now. No, no. So that, uh, and there's no change. While you have an adversarial system with profiteering, ideologically and financially, that will not change. Yeah. And once again, the only people you can blame is men for allowing it to happen. Because they did stood on the sidelines. Oh, we'll give the little women this. We'll give the little women that. I often think that modern men is like the horse in animal farm. Must work harder, must work harder. Stupidity, to my simple mind, you asked me about uh, intellectual background earlier. It's very simple. To my simple mind, nature has never changed. It will always take advantage of the weak. That's nature. That's evolution. And we have a process in the family courts where the weak, because of the gender, are the fathers, and if a massive system set up to take advantage of that, and until the people who have been taken advantage of do something about it, it will only increase because it's always a nature to increase. Yeah. Now, what makes me believe that there may be improvements in it is I look at the Catholic Church in Ireland from a position of total omnipotence and fallibility to yeah. self destruction. I look at the Berlin Wall, you know, things like this. I have seen some of the biggest changes. In society. I look at the rights for black people in North America. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I grew up watching the riots in the 60s, late 60s and all the rest. So I, I, I've seen those things change. I've seen Northern Ireland change massively. ACP in Northern Ireland, my own home province. That's equivalent to me growing black hair on top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be changed, but there is so little appetite to change. That's so depressing. It is. So you have weak litigants in person because the system is so strong. You then have virtually no 
carry on afterwards. No, no follow on to bring about improvements, to help others to bring about improvements. And uh, that's why it's the way it is. P people aren't doing anything about it. Edmund Burke was right. The greatest mistake any one ever made was to do nothing because you thought you could only do a little. I have that in the book as well. <laughs> Which reminds me, somebody who's watching this is going to, Vincent's kindly offered to give, do a signed copy and we can give that to somebody who's watching. You give me the and name and address or I'll send it to you and you send it on. Perfect, yeah. perfect. Um, finally, yeah. um, you've done, well, you have worked with the Shared Parenting char Charity Families Need Fathers for so many years. And in fact, I know noticed that in your book, you gave shout out to the the Welsh counterparts, Paula yeah, Prida. Particularly the Welsh counterparts, yeah. Uh, Paula Prida, Anna Reagan. Of course, we all go kind of Absolutely. Go Great respect for that woman has done. Among the most capable people in this business are a few grandmothers. Erin Pitsy, Anna Reagan. Yeah. You know, I mean, look what she's accomplished. And you get all these spoofers of men that are going to do this, going to do that. If you get off the butt, they might do something. <laughs> a great regard for Paula Prida, the work he does and all the rest. I mean, I'm not totally... Uh, a mouthpiece for the national charity in England because I have reservations about some of the, uh, as I said in the book, and I've no reason to change that. No. Someone asked me to explain why I don't work closer with the, not with the trustees, but with the national office. And once again, out of somewhere, I don't know where it came from, I says, my energy and their inertia are non aligned. I love that. I think I, I like that I too love, myself. I don't know where I came from. I, I surprised myself, Michaela. Inspired, Vincent. Eh? You what? It's inspired. <laughs> Madness can be very inspiring. <laughs> Amen to that. Someone once asked me what's needed to be a volunteer in this business. Uh, once again, I came up with uh, my definition of, uh, I says, you need three ingredients to be a volunteer in this business. You need to be a bit of a nutter, a hard worker, and a bit of a brain. The problem is, in all of these affected groups, the nutters are the hardest workers, and they dominate the few brains that exist. And that I see for so I'm 14 years involved with Families Need Fathers and other shared parent associations. And that's what I see all the time. The endless cinnamon wheel, endless energy, the circle gets tighter and tighter, comes to a stop. Yeah. yeah, it's like an electrical circuit that the fuse has been pulled out of. They go fine until they get to where the impact was in life, and then it's endless loop. Yeah, it's like being the McDonald's isn't the bad music. <laughs> Vincent, thank you so. Thank so you, much. more Michaela. And thank see, you and, seriously. Um, and Stephen. Yeah, no, you have inspired loads of people, and you've got a meeting tonight, haven't you? Yeah, it's the usual me weekly meeting tonight. Uh, of which I would say at least a quarter of the time will be wasted trying to get them to just observe basic discipline, which is answer the question you are asked, please, and not the long statements you want to make. <laughs> you come across that, changed. no doubt. Nothing's changed. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Well, we're doing something. I would far rather be doing something than doing nothing. I couldn't live with doing nothing. And through this business, I met people such as yourself, Stephen, and lots of others. I have to say that the wisdoms small w that uh, Stephen puts on the social media and times for how to conduct your case. I absolutely applaud them. But what he needs is a large hammer to hammer it into people's heads. I know. He's too delicate. He's not. Trust me, he's not. Oh, don't be frightening me. Don't be frightening me. <laughs> <laughs> right, guys, I hope you've really found that useful. Um, any comments, pop them down um, in the comments below. Any questions you want, pop them down. And um, that all that leaves me to say is, Vincent, it has been an absolute privilege. Thank you so and, much. And, and equally, and equally. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.